Well, we've got three wonderful presenters tonight with great stories and wonderful, wonderful and wonderfully different art expression. And they are the three of them are um, featured in our current show at the gallery that was just open today called Many Threads, One Cloth. It's all fiber artists and it's exciting and varied and really it's a wonderful show. So we welcome, we would really love everybody to show up there and take a look. Also in, invite you to our um, reception this coming Sunday, which is the 28th from two to 4 p.m. So you'll meet, meet the artists and see this great work and it will be a, a fun time as well. So uh, that's that for now. And um, we have wonderful artists, which you've probably seen in the announcement. We have Yanat Mikolov, we have Tobin Keller and Jody Alexander. And um, yes. <laughs> and each artist will have approximately 20 minutes to talk about the work, to show their images and tell their story. And after the, and during that time, we will turn, we would like the audio mics to be turned off so that we don't interfere with any sound while they're presenting. And afterwards, after each presentation, we will welcome comments and questions to the artists and it would be that it would be really wonderful to engage them that way too if anything comes up that you'd like to discuss as you're watching their show um see what else do i need to say i think that's it for now except i get to introduce everybody the first presenter is yonat mikolov she's a tapestry weaver uh, and a nature photographer and often uses the photographs to render realism with thread in her gorgeous weavings. Uh, she's a fabric dot dyer as well, using natural materials to create brilliant colors to, that she uses to weave. Her work expresses a deep connection with the, with the natural world, focusing on such things as migration, climate change, feminine strength and wisdom, Numerous key galleries and museums, such as the San Jose Museum of Quilts and Textiles, have featured her work. So now we're proud to present Yonat. Do you like to share your screen? Super scary. Super scary, and everybody else has never known. done it before, but whatever. <laughs> we're, uh, let's, so welcome. let's dive in. Let me see if I can. Uh, Share my screen. Uh, and I am going to do a slideshow. I'm not sure if that will go. Always go into this, but hopefully it will go quickly. Okay. All right. So, just a little bit about myself. Um, I, artist is not part of my identity yet. It's taking a long time. I was an acupuncturist for 33 years um, and I do a lot of different things. And um, I grew, I was born and grew up in a kibbutz in Israel. Uh, my last name is clearly Russian ancestors, Russian Jews. And I grew up a lot around uh, kind of a can do it mentality. You know, I grew up on a kibbutz where we did everything and we learned a lot of different things. And it was just like, I can do it. If you can do it, I can do it mentality, which I think contribute to my journey, which is pretty crazy. So when my girls were young, I was, uh, uh, I just needed some kind of uh, coping mechanism. And if, and I went to Golden Fleece and I met uh, wonderful people there. And um, somehow or another, I got talked into getting a huge loom, Glimokra. And I start weaving on it. It's eight harnesses. It's complex. It's crazy. I have no idea why I ended up there. But I was like, oh. Yeah, if they can do it, I can do it mentality. And I just got it and brought it up for the second floor in our house. And my girls were excited. Then I start 
the next kind of stage was that was really big. It takes forever to warp. I'm gonna go into and play with Inkulum. So I have quite a few. This is different things that I did with Inkulum, and I'll, there is a picture of an Inkulum in there. This is Latvian design and Sami Lapland designs. I was playing, I loved it. It was pickup, it was a brain work, it was about texture. I am a knitter and I knit since I was six. And we used to have to knit uh, hats for soldiers when third grade. So um, I always knit. My mom was a crochet and a filet crochet. Uh, so there was a lot of art around me, even though I never really looked at it as art, my idea that things are craft. I tried my hand in beading and cabochon and basically everywhere there was a rabbit hole, I dove in there. And, one, and then I got into, into a glass bead making totally got into it. Everything I kind of do for a few years and I do it and until I'm like, okay, now I have 4,000 beads and I don't know what to do with it. I need a different hobby. So that's when I usually hop into a different hobby. This is a braiding techniques. I was very interested in braiding, finger braiding. So these are all sorts of different crafts. This is a big Inca loom. And as you can see, there is to, it's a bend loom, uh, it's a bend weaving, and I tried different techniques on that. I think I wanted to get rid of this loom, that's why I took a picture, otherwise I don't seem to have a normal picture. Uh, but these are just things that I did, combination of different techniques, and I was very, very intrigued by different um, structure, structure of cloth. And, and I, it was just uh, something to learn and to be excited about. This is a whole bunch of uh, sashes and bands that I wove for a picture together. So you can see there's a million techniques here. These are Peruvian techniques. Uh, this is more like um, Mexican. There is, uh, that's the Latvian. There is the double weave, there is Bedouin, there is like a whole bunch of different techniques. This is also um, Mexican, different, different, uh, different design, different things. Just every pattern that was brought to me, I needed to try and recreate new ones. It was just very, it was kind of interesting. Then I, I was very lucky to, and to have Martha Stanley in our guild at that time. I joined the guild and Martha was leading a um, rug workshop and where I learned the art of wedge weave, which is a, an old, non, not really popular Navajo design. Uh, style of weaving that the traders didn't like it that much, so it never really made it out, but it's still there. And I have a friend, uh, Janet Gross, and she does, Janet Gross, I don't know why I said, and she has pieces, she has like three pieces in the, in the art show, and they're all wedge weave, she's the wedge weave master. Uh, this is more eccentric, this is kind of wedge weave go, wild that was a different period right around that time i was encountering uh the um, raven tail weavers we brought a woman here named cheryl cheryl samuel and she was teaching us how to do um raven tail and not chill cut but it's a very it's it's a textile that was developed or evolved in uh, the Clinkit Nation, the Pacific Northwest uh, in Alaska and North Washington, mostly in Alaska. Uh, this is, and I went and studied with some native um, teachers. I loved this. I love that technique. It's the most luscious fabric there is. I just, 
this is leggings. They go around the legs when you dance with them. So it's called the lightning design. And I was in love with that for a few years. That's the only thing I did. These are little amulet, um, uh, just like little tiny bags to put stuff in it. This is my teacher, Evelyn. She's working on a chilcot. And that was, it's this really sophisticated technique of weaving. And I was totally in love with that. That is a circle. It's, it's all about twining, which is wrapping the fiber around the warp that comes from above. I just did all those things because I was totally in love with it. This was my creation. And my creation had to be very different. Different colors, different shapes, not their pattern because otherwise it's kind of appropriation. So I did it after my mom passed away and it was, um, it was basically breaking a pattern. So it was a broken pattern kind of. Um, kind of uh, weaving, it was very emotional and I love it, it's still behind me. That's when Laverne, this teacher from Bolivia came and started teaching us backstrap and we were totally into backstrap. So here I'm weaving a backstrap band that will go around my back and I will do it and this is it. Uh, it's very wide. It's my first tapestry that I did in Mendocino. I decided I want to do an owl face. It was, it's very small. I still have it here. Um, meanwhile, I still have the loom and I wove shawls and all sorts of scarves. This is like knitting, knitting yarn that I just needed to get rid of. So that's what I did. I did lots of scarves and donated it. This is when I start exploring um, exploring tapestry without really having much of a background. They're still good, but I did not, I had no clue what I was doing. I was just kind of like trying to mimic something. This is a picture of a picture that I took of the sun of the sunset and I had a picture behind me and that's what I was doing. And I got into dyeing. Everything is continue. Whatever I start before, continue to the next and to the next. And before I know it, I have about 5,000 hobbies. And whoever knows me knows that I keep on accumulating new hobbies as we go. So that was clearly indigo. Uh, ties and blocks and playing with that. Here is more eccentric weaving. This is a redwood, it's kind of like a 3D protruding. And then oh, what happened then, it, I realized that in order to be a uh, tapestry weaver, I need to learn art because I had zero education in art. And so I went to the art league and I took every class that there was. I took the pastel colors, the watercolors, the still life, the figure drawing, um, and just went for it. In the meantime, there was another workshop about another technique called split, no, ply, split ply. It's a technique from Afghanistan where you make a, you make like, um, it's not a yarn. You make like a, you row, you take different, like a whole bunch of yarn and you make them into a, a rope and then you basically poke it in. And that's how you weave, you weave through it. This is another one of this ply split. This is a sprang, a whole other technique that Carol um, was teaching us and it's amazing. Carol James from Canada. 
I was making samples for her book. She was doing a book and she wanted me to do samples to check them out. This is finger weaving, a whole other technique of weaving. And here is the watercolor period. I took a lot of colors in uh, a lot of um, classes in watercolor and botanical drawing. God, it looks like I cut a lot of stuff. This is when I got into dyeing with um, mushroom and lichen. This is the color that came out of lichen and it was in a symposium of like mushroom dyeing symposium in North Vancouver, North of Vancouver. And it was such a wonderful time. So this is just a sample of, this is all the colors we got from the mushroom in that symposium. And it was from just from mushrooms, mushrooms and lichens. So I got into that big time. I went to Norway and studied that too. This is still weaving, still weaving on my Glimokra. It's a workshop I did, we did with Porfirio. This is a Sapotec Designs. Meanwhile, I just feel like I'm collecting knowledge. And of course, I got into baskets. This is a cedar basket, went into basket galore. This is a basket that we did in the guild, just more baskets. And then I got into botanical printing. That was about five years of crazy botanical printing. I went all over the world and took every workshop and had thousands of scarves and sold tons of them. And then I was totally tired of it. That's kind of new that I'm tired of it. I'm, I still have all the equipment, but I'm not interested so much. This is what I got, the botanical printing. Yeah, it's pretty amazing, but this is on a leather, printing on leather. This is a Salish weaving, a whole other system with a whole other loom. And this is when I got more into tapestry and I did um, braided river from Alaska, a picture I took and I was kind of, it was my really big first tapestry on a loom that I kind of had a clue what I want to do. This is samples of dyeing with um, eucalyptus, which by the way, my background is all dyed with uh, natural dyes from this county. This is another, another one that was on display at the Art League for a while. This is my figure drawing class, which I totally got into. I still do it every Tuesday. This is the new, um, the Maori. This is a Maori uh, twining technique that takes three, with three colors you twine. Uh, I went to New Zealand and I studied with some, I studied with a teacher there, totally got into that. This is also Maori technique. And this is um, kind of eccentric weave with, uh, I wove it when Kavana got um, kind of elected into the Supreme Court. I was very angry. And so that's, it was blood and women figures. That was a Bhutanese technique that I studied and I really enjoy that a lot. I did travel a lot in the world before I ended up here. So this is Nantucket baskets that I was, um, yeah, still, still have a lot of them to do. I did quite a few, I did about five. And it's a very, very special technique. Here are my tapestry weavers. This is the different 
This is a Navajo person that I took a picture of her. And this is Nilda, my Peruvian teacher. This is Julia. Uh, what's her last name? I forgot. She teaches basketry in, she's probably really old. I'm not sure she's alive. And this is kind of like a Maori weaver. I did not have a picture of my teacher and kind of wanted something. Now, the interesting thing about this four tapestries, um, they're all behind me. They're all made with, except for the blue and the black, they're all made with mushroom. All the colors, all the dyes in those pictures are made of mushroom dyes. This is the picture that I was kind of thinking for a long time about the climate change. And that was woven uh, in COVID. And this is just kind of to show you how it worked. You know, I had my idea and it kind of evolved slowly. This is just a way to see how it goes. Small experiments, you know, with open warp to see how it feels to work like that. This is the migration piece that is in um, that is in the show. This is a project I did uh, a course of the natural California naturalist in UCSC. And my project was to create fiber that um, the fiber was from here, the wool was from a sheep that grew up here in Soquel. And I dyed it with everything just from this county um including i did not use chemicals i used ocean water and some lichen as a mordanting because i wanted to be kind of true to the goal and i got some really nice this is the process and i got some really interesting colors and i got quite i got few weaving the trees, this one, the California hills, and the one behind me. This is another weaving that I did for a show that is going to, it's in England starting in October, and it's called The Waterline. And we are 14 weavers from all over the world who wove uh, some kind of a area with of water in our area with a silver line and all of them are going to be connected along the silver line this is a for that i did it for the for um uh postcard exchange something that the weavers decided to do uh this is monterey area small tapestries That was the theme was acorn. I grew up, I, I was where I was born, there was a oak tree and I used to love the acorn. I used to go to sleep with acorns. So, and my mom made me a sweater with acorn buttons. So I'm, I have a very special love for acorns and I collect them from all over the world. I got into birding, so I was doing, I got, went to see um, the Sandhill Cranes and I got really inspired. I had a lot of pictures and that's that was my inspiration. And so is the reflected uh, pelican, white pelican. This is my latest piece. It's called My Body, My Choice and it's about the Roe versus Wade. And that's it. So uh, I should You're not, it's, a, it's a fabulous showing of your all of the rabbit holes you entered. <laughs> I am a rabbit hole digger. <laughs> your, your curiosity and your can do ness. I don't know why. I think you have to start calling yourself an artist. This is it's your journey is just <laughs> no deep. kidding. Wow. Truly, your journey is is got much depth to it, and you're just very successful. Keep going. You know, it's like every rabbit, there is always new rabbit hole. That's that's <laughs> the interesting part. 
I mean, you can, I have some friends here and I'm sure they can attest that it's like, okay, what is she going to come up with today? You know, every time I hear about new technique, somebody just showed up a new technique, immediately I have to go and try it. And then I have to show them all. And they are like, wait, we're still struggling with the old technique. You know, it's, it's like, fascinating ah. and beautifully executed, you know, everything that you do. I think it's this can-do mentality. I think that's really the difference about how I approach things. I just don't, you know, if I always think, oh, they can do it. I'm sure I can figure it out. That's great. Tobin, yeah. do you have something to comment? I just want to. I, I just want to say how impressed I am. You're not. Um, the range of work that you've done is so beautiful, um, and the depth of study. An investigation is amazing. I, I'm totally in love with the mushroom dyes and um, being a, a, not a natural dyer, I really feel like I should be more responsible and do something more organic and, and um, earthly considerate. So I really respect what you do. Thank you for sharing so much of your work. Um, I feel so much more uh, elevated looking at your oh, work. Thank Good you. point, yeah. Would anybody else like to comment or ask a question of you not? I have a question. Yes. This is Roberta. <clears throat> there may be a bit of a delay on my, my um, audio, but um, I was interested in the idea, you not, that you had no art training and that it was after a lot of pieces that had figures and birds and things, I believe that you went and you took um, figure drawing and art classes. And I'm wondering how that was to learn something that it seemed like you already had a good foundation in. Um, and how was that, that training for you? Oh, it was amazing. I realized how much I did not see uh, it improved my observation skills. There was just so much more. I just feel like I constantly get more layers of uh, understanding of how things work, you know. Um, I, I love every time and, and you know, it, I, I'm sound excited, but it's not easy. I have to kind of go and dig. I have to make mistakes. I have to get frustrated, take it out, you know, um, but it doesn't bother me. I feel like I'm learning so much. I kind of like to go to places where I don't, I mean, figure drawing was super scary. I have to admit because human form has so many angst about it you know I mean it, botanical drawing was in a way easier you know to analyze like a, a leaf or a flower uh, was easier than human body but it all of it adds I feel like it's just little ingredients that keep on adhering to my brain and and they're there they're there to help so far <laughs> um Rosie I see that Kim Tyler has her hands up to ask yes I see that too yep. Kim um, thank you. I just want to say, like Tobin did, that I'm so impressed and inspired by your your breadth and by the quantity of work and the range of stuff that you've done. And I'm really have been taken since we came on screen by the piece that you're sitting in front of. And I'm sorry we didn't get a better look at that. But how big is that? And um, it's not big. And this is basically the a picture that I took from a point Lobos of the layering of the kind of like the rocks there, which was so inspiring for me. And I wanted to do it for a long time, but I didn't know how to convey it. And it's not very big. It's like 24 by like 20 or something like that. And yeah. it's all colors from here, which is, special to me. I mean, all those pieces were very special to me because the yarn was from here and the color was from here. There is something to say about that. I loved not to be a polluter. 
in a world of so much mm -hmm. pollution. So yeah. You're yeah. not, there's several chat messages. I just wanted to, I'm gonna read them for you, okay? Oh. Leslie Bixel, Bixel, I love these wedge weaves, weaving you, you're not. Well, great work with mushroom dyes. Jan Janet Gross says, Jeanette. Jeanette, thank you. Excellent work, you're not. Oh. Chris Nardello, yeah, you did a great job. Jeanette Gross, it's true, you're not. You can do everything. <laughs> Jody Alexander, enormous depth and breadth of your work. Beautiful, you're not. And that Nemes, fantastic work. How many hours a day do you weave? How long does it, a tapestry take to weave? That's a very good question. It takes, I don't know. I actually <laughs> really don't know. Uh, you can ask me how many murder mystery books they take. I could probably say that. <laughs> <laughs> on audible yeah audible audible is the greatest service to the universe <laughs> um yeah i'm yeah i'm almost finishing with uh, jd kirk from scotland so it's like it's unbelievable i just kind of go through them um it depends some of them take a long time some of them don't some of them take oh god i how do you even think about it? I don't know. I know that I weave in the evenings. I don't weave during the day. It's like in the evening around seven, eight, I start weaving. And uh, admittingly, I am a very late, late uh, sleep. I go to sleep really late, mm -hmm. like one-ish, one thirty. I actually get all my excitement really late at night. I I'm kind of getting my inspiration. <laughs> and then I wake up at 7.30 in the morning, no matter what. So yeah, um, but I do, I weave in the evening. Sometimes there is snags, some things that I can't figure out that I have to think about that I'm not really sure I like it. So I don't know, it takes time, but you know, what else am I gonna do with my time? Well, you accomplish a lot. <laughs> You're not, thank you so much for this thank you. Thank presentation. You so much, it's so inspiring to be in your presence with your wonderful work and your story. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. And now we're fortunate to hear from Tobin Keller. Uh, Tobin is a fine artist with an emphasis on surface design. He's a printmaker and photographer working with various silk fabrics, hand dyeing and screen printing with dyes, pigments and mixed media images, as well as he is a fashion designer whose unique clothing has been featured on the art of fashion runways. Layers, veils, hidden images, networking connections are intentionally placed to tell the full story of his pieces. His work has been widely exhibited and collected. Thank you, Tobin, and welcome. Well, thank you, Rosie. That is totally humbling introduction. Thank you so much for that. Um, I'm going to sort of demure away from the fashion designer um, and maybe the textile artist just a little bit. But I want to thank you so much for being very gracious and understanding and accommodating me, as well as Hedwig and Roberta and Val. You have all been so encouraging um, to get my shit together. Sorry about that. And it worked. <laughs> um, I'm going to show you. I'm going to show you a series of works. I'm going to. I'm going to start at sort of at a pivotal moment of change with my work. So I'll share the screen, um, and I'll. I will apologize in advance that I might not be also linear. I might not be that linear in my um, my talk here, um, especially since I've been talking all week. This is our flex week at Cabrillo College. Um, I'm not only a teacher at Cabrillo College, but I'm also our faculty union president. And I've been doing a series of presentations um, in person, on stage for hundreds of people. And it's been a really exciting, um, exhausting, wonderfully overwhelming week being back uh, fully in person in front of a lot of faculty and staff that I, that I lo love dearly. But here we go. Um, so <laughs> that's my name. And this is the show. I'm gonna dive right into the artwork. So um, this is the pivotal change here that I wanna talk about. I was printing, um, screen printing 
on transparent media, a lot of um, glass, large acrylic sheets, um, multi-panels um, that were um, fairly large, cumbersome, um, fun to work with. Um, they were heavy. And um, you know, the, one of the reasons I wanted to work so large is because I wanted to work life size. Um, the, two, the two side pieces that you see, and this is a conglomerate image, the two side pieces you see, um, they're both six foot panels. Um, and they come from a series of, um, a, a series called Men and Other Portraits. And I did a series of male friends, you know, mostly studying identity. And then the piece in the middle is a series of people. Um, well, it's a self-portrait on either, either side. And in between my self-portraits are people that were inspirational or somehow impacted my life. So it's sort of all those people in my brain um, that have impacted me. And um, it, was a, it was a beautiful piece that I did for a particular installation. Um, so portraiture has been really important over the years. So I, I, I move in and out of portraiture. Um, you'll see what I'm doing recently when I get to the last slides, but this was a pivotal change for me. Um, again, I really started focusing on myself and understanding who I was as a human, as you know, a man, and how I, you know, how I sort of fit in society. So um, understanding people who influenced me or somehow um, helped to form who I was, was a very important observation with my work. And you know, here's another thing, and I gotta thank Jane Gregorius for this. Um, Jane introduced me to screen printing, damn it. And that was another huge pivotal moment. Um, I took Jane's screen printing class, not knowing really. I thought, well, this would be fun. And Jane's an awesome teacher. Uh, and it just changed my life. It, you know, screen printing has become something bigger, bigger than I understand. And um, I've been so excited about it for many, many years. And I've been very motivated by it. So I just really want to thank Jane for that inspiration. Um, and the, um, the enthusiasm that she had for this medium, because it just opened up a whole new series of, for me, um, ways to express and um, different types of materials that I can work on. So working on glass, working on acrylic, um, working on different kinds of substrates, and you'll see working on silk fabrics has really led me in all kinds of great directions. And now, and I teach screen printing now, um, and you know, it's really an exciting thing to inspire students um, how screen printing works. So these are just some more examples. There's some small glass pieces that I did. I did a residency at Annie Glass one summer and I was able just to experiment freely screen printing on layered glass that was then, um, they were fused together in a kiln. Um, so everything became really nice and beautifully melted together and permanent. It was an awesome thing. And then some other self-portrait, I'm, I'm sorry, some other portrait combinations on different kinds of material. But after doing, after doing this work for a while, um, the glass was really heavy. The giant um, plexiglass or acrylic panels were really heavy, um, cumbersome to ship to exhibitions. So I decided I wanted to do something a little lighter, something that was easier to move around, um, you know, that wasn't so physical. So I decided I'm going to print on fabric because, you know, fabric's easy. And I could still get that same idea of transparency or translucency because that was certainly an attraction to this media. I love transparency and I love cast shadow. And it's that sort of magic what, happen, what happens when you shine a light on something that's transparent and the shadow that becomes stronger and more, more important in a way. So um, fabric, I thought, I'm going to work on fabric. I knew nothing about printing on fabric. I knew nothing about dyes. I knew nothing about screen printing dyes. So I taught myself. And I just started experimenting a lot on um, silk fabrics. I got to the point where, oh, I love this. I love silk gauze. Silk gauze was wonderful to dye. So I started dyeing everything in these really saturated colors. I just went everywhere with color. Um, and I don't know if you know some of my really early work but it was pretty much strictly black and white. I avoided color. Um, my former teacher and mentor, Jay DeFeo said, black and white is all the color you really need. And I adhered to that, that concept quite a lot, but something happened here. Um, I exploded in color and it was fabulous. And then I started printing on the fabric. I started doing um, discharge printing as well as dye printing on the, um, the, dyed, the dyed fabrics. So, um, doing this quite a bit, then I started thinking, well, maybe 
it would be interesting to see some of these dyed fabrics on a body. And I started collaborating with a friend. Um, she was actually a student of mine at the time, Barbara Bartels. She was a pattern maker and designer from LA. And she retired to Santa Cruz. And um, she was so nice to, to work with me and create patterns for some of these, these scarves that I was creating. Um, and then I learned how to actually print and dye yardage. Um, and this was fun. This is like, oh, this is all exciting. I can really see these fabrics come to life on a human form. And so I started exploring that and it was wonderful collaborating with Barbara. Now, keep in mind, Barbara was already retired. <laughs> and here I was, you know, mid-career in a big life change, all excited about this new thing. And I kept, I kept drawing Barbara back in. And um, it, was, it was really fascinating and a huge learning curve. I had no idea, you know, what the fashion industry was really like. I like Project Runway, right? But, you know, I was totally naive. I was in love with the fabric. And I just loved um, printing on the various kinds of silk. So we started doing these shows for Fashion Art Santa Cruz and some other small shows. And, you know, we started creating these mini lines. And um, they were all thematic. Um, you know, Jen, I would come up with the theme, Barbara would come up with the patterns and, and we'd work together and it was a really nice working relationship. Um, and it was a lot of fun to, you know, show these things on stage um, and to see how the fabrics actually came to life. And, you know, just to think, think of the artwork in a, in a different form. And for me, it was always, always about printing. And it was about coming up with different imagery that I could layer together. So I still love this idea of layering fabrics together, layering images together, and then also working with a theme. So the portrait was still very much, very much um, inspiring the work. So here's a few more. These are um, the piece on the left is a soap broadcloth, and there it is in an installation at Cabrillo with a um, a gown that was inspired by the same imagery. So you know, I like to think there's a narrative to the work that I'm doing because I do start with, you know, I do start with the basic concept. Bloodline um, really had to do with, um, you know, my family, my DNA, um, but it also had to do with, um, it had to do a lot with um, women and especially the women in my life that have been such a strong influence. So I kept going at it and things went into interesting directions. They kind of went sort of high fashion and. You know, it was flattering and awesome and fun to see these things that I created on these beautiful, beautiful people. Um, and, you know, it kept, it kept, I don't know, it kept getting more exciting and more expensive and more away from me. <laughs> so all that work I did in self-identity and self, you know, acknowledgement and understanding who I, I was as an artist started to drift in another direction. It was fun. But it wasn't, you know, quite who I was, but kept at it and kept getting excited about these patterns. And that's something that really resonated. Oh, I'm going to put all these different patterns together. I'm going to dye fabrics. I'm going to remove color with different screens. I'm going to add um, patterns on top of patterns. And, and Barbara was excited about the work and we just kept going. Um, and so it was, it was fun and just to see what we could do and to see these fabrics transform into different, different wearables. And it was always sort of, um, oh, not necessarily sportswear. Uh, sometimes it was called resort wear, but you know, more casual wear. And I love this line especially because the, the use of patterns and prints that I was doing here. And remember that I'm dyeing all the fabric, everything you see is first dyed and then it's printed. I right, start out with white fabric all the time. Um, and these are various kinds of silks, but you know, I was, I was photographing patterns. I was, um, I was at Père Lachaise uh, Cemetery in Paris, photographing tombstones and and bronze grates, and um, just having a lot of fun resourcing my own imagery that I could print. Um, so I kept at it, and then the pattern started to shift. And something that happens in screen printing that you don't want really to happen is the secondary or tertiary pattern called a moray that can be really disturbing if you, if you um, we're talking about a photographic process in screen printing. It's something that actually detracts from an image, but I fell in love with that, that moray, that secondary um, visual effect. 
So I thought, I'm gonna create moray patterns. I'm gonna intentionally make morays happen. And so I started working with a single screen in a four color and in a four color process. So cyan, magenta, yellow, and black. I thought, I'm gonna, I'm gonna mess around with this. And it became a really fun discipline to work with a single screen and these four colors and layer them to create these secondary or tertiary optical effects. So that I got obsessed with that. And I've been going at it since. So this was about 20, I'd say this was about 2015. Yeah, 20, about 2015. So I played with these optical screens, just loving the way that I could create these, um, these optical illusions on the fabric. And this is just, you know, wonderful silk broadcloth. And sometimes I would switch it up and try different colors. Sometimes I would withhold like the piece on the right and do just a single color and mix up the screen. So I fell in love with pattern. And this is a view of my studio, just to give you an idea um, of how I work. I work you know, flat. Um, I have a couple very long uh, wide tables that I can do the work on. So just to give you an idea of how I make this happen in my studio, um, I do have I do have a separate uh, wet studio for making my screens. So I, I took a sabbatical, 2014, 2015 was another big, um, big year for me because I took a sabbatical from Cabrillo and um, I sold my house. I moved to the west side of Santa Cruz into a live work space and I did some traveling and I did some traveling as part of my sabbatical. And when I came back, I did a sabbatical exhibition at the Cabrillo Gallery called The Narrative Cloth. And, but one of the wonderful things, of course, about being on sabbatical and traveling, is you get to meet other pugs. So um, I got to meet, well, I actually knew this pug, Lola. Um, I was visiting with a friend in Paris and I also did a little research in Paris on printed fabric. And then I also went to the um, Victoria and Albert Museum to their archives to study historic hand-printed fabrics. That was really important because I, you know, I had to have a um, concept to some of my sabbatical research. So I got to go back into the archives of Victoria and Albert and look at um, hand-printed fabrics that were hundreds of years old. And it was fascinating, um, you know, just to, to see a little bit of history of European uh, hand-printed fabrics, block-printed fabrics. They were mostly block-printed fabrics. Um, so I did that and then I came back and I had moved and then I had my exhibition at Cabrillo College. Um, the three panels in the back are the three panels that are in the Pajaro Valley Gallery exhibition. So my sabbatical exhibition was really, it was really a reflection on my travels and what I had learned. And it was also a returning back to the portrait but this time, instead of just focusing on myself, I focused on my family, my immediate family. And so I started collecting old, old family portraits and uh, um, incorporating them into the, the printed designs. So I started screen printing again on the silks and just um, with all these wonderful resourced family photos and just layering them in fun ways um, without too much direction. I just wanted to create some sort of family album-like thing that had just sort of gone awry. Um, connecting the heart symbol, um, the target spiral symbol. Um, and I, I can talk about, you know, the meaning of the symbolism of the hummingbird and the heart and all of that, the horse skull. But I don't know. Um, I think that would not be, as, not be as interesting. But it creating connections. And the heart, of course, is the, the heart that, you know, and the, and the love that I have for my family. Um, you know, and like any family, there were lots and lots of struggles in the past, but I'm um, trying to, trying to, again, understand the relationship of my family currently and the history of my family by um, sort of seeming together these various images of family. But then, okay, I thought, oh, I, I, I wanted to do something not on fabric. Fabric is wonderful, it's time consuming, it's a lot of process to, hand dyeing and then um, printing and fixing and steam setting all the silks and the dyes are all wonderful and beautiful. There's a lot of process to it. And I do love process. So I thought, well, you know, I really wanna study pattern in a different way. I wanna really study 
um, sort of intensity of layered pattern. With the fabrics, I could only go so, so far with layering. And again, it was the printing process that drives me. It was that using that screen and squeezing the ink with a um, squeegee through that screen, I loved it. And I loved the physicality of working large. I work on the large tables, large pieces of paper or fabric, and I move around and I move around a lot printing. And I got much more interested in the economy of imagery. And what I meant is I, I, I disciplined myself to three stencils on the same screen. They're all the same image, just different sizes. And I thought, what can I do with that limitation of three stencils? So I started printing. I said, okay, I'll work on it. Um, and then I'll start changing the color that I use to print and layering. So the piece on the left is about four by six feet. The piece on the right is a smaller um, study for the piece on the left. And I do hand color with watercolors or acrylic ink. So these are all acrylic ink on um, paper. And I thought, how far can I go with printing these three stencils to create some other um, image or an illusion? And I realized that I go really far and I can spend months and months doing this. So, you know, about a thousand, a thousand prints later and some specific hand coloring, I came up with this um, um, sort of atmospheric print on the left. And so I tried other things. I, again, I went back to my favorite, my favorite image, that's that sort of target thing. And I wanted to play around with that to see what it would do. And then COVID happened. And, you know, as with everyone else, it really changed, it really changed the way we thought, the way we live, the way we think, the way we work. So um, yes, this is not, by the way, this is not a COVID. Um, it looks like one, but it's not. And I just love the original image. Um, and this is two different, actually three different stencils in the large piece on the left. And it's about four, about four feet by five and a half feet. And the one on the right is a study. Again, trying to discipline myself to a limit, limit of stencils to see what I can do by just repeating them and layering them. Um, and I did like the illusion of, you know, being sort of overwhelmed by this virus-like form and, um, you know, seeing how much depth I could get out of it without losing um, the image. And what's so nice about screen printing with acrylic ink is that if it becomes um, gray or too dark, I can bring lights back into it. And that's harder to do with fabric. So then I just thought, I'm just gonna get messy. I'm gonna mess around. Uh, this one, I went a little too overboard with different stencils, but again, I just sort of love the results. And this one was more landscape inspired. I thought, oh, I, I like the landscape inspired look. So um, I went with it and I did a little more hand coloring. The piece on the right is the large uh, piece. And the piece on the, I'm sorry, reverse that. The piece on the left is large. The piece on the right is the smaller study. And I thought, all right, that's fun. What am I going to do next? You know, and here we are still in COVID, but I was working very slow and mostly I was focused on teaching. You know, um, as you might know, teaching really changed in spring of 2020. Um, the way we started teaching um, really changed. And so most of my energy and focus was learning how to teach again remotely and learning how to accommodate uh, students remotely. Um, and I started essentially teaching remotely out of my studio and um, preparing students screens out of my studio. So, um, because we weren't allowed to be on campus. So things slowed down, things became messy, things became harder, but I still did my work, but even though I slowed down like crazy. So anyway, bring it all around. This is the most recent piece. Um, it has evolved since this photograph was taken. And this is 10 feet long, it's about, it's, it's about four and a half feet by 10 feet. I'm showing the piece as it is now um, at the Cabrillo Gallery in the staff and faculty exhibition that will be opening up next week. Um, and I got really excited. One thing that happened with this piece, it, you know, it, it then became more specific landscape. And I'm okay with that. And it was also pretty. And I was all okay with that too. Um, but I had this idea of doing a, um, a long landscape. 
And again, it's evolved since this photo, but you know, I'm very excited about this. And I started this piece back in May and just worked slowly on it. And I finally let it go on Tuesday to the gallery. And I miss it because <laughs> it's been here in my studio for months and it's been this wonderful collaboration that has been, and I, I'm afraid to say it's been an easy collaboration from the beginning. Some pieces you struggle with. This didn't have any struggle. And my teacher, Jay DeFeo, said she never trusted an artwork that didn't have a struggle, something she didn't have to nurse along. Well, I did nurse this along, but there wasn't a, really a struggle. I just I kept at it. It kept happening. And so um, this piece is called Forevermore, 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 spelled differently. You know, forevermore is one of those wonderful words. You can spell uh, three different ways, right? And I just love that. And so um, this is where I'm at right now. And, you know, something about scale and color, and I am limited to my color. I'm still working with CMYK color, my four colors, and the same three stencils after, uh, I don't know, four years of working with those same three stencils, seeing how far I can push them. Um, so that's the economy of imagery, the economy of color, and the excess of scale that I love. And I'm gonna end right here because these little pugs keep me company. Um, they're much older now, but um, you know, my little rescued pugs are just a, a important part of my studio. So thank you, everyone. <laughs> Beautiful. Thank you. <laughs> Rosie, you're muted, Rosie. Thanks. Oh, so beautiful, Tobin. And I, you know, I might be stretching it to say this, but it, they, your work feels mystical to me. And oh, I God. feel like, you know, there's a connection from, you know, even when you're doing the, the uh, self-portraits and the families and the depth of the, you know, le keeping layers there. And then this work, is like over and over and over again, get, getting deeper and deeper. I keep thinking about the James Webb's web images, you know, that we're looking at in outer space. And I'm thinking, yeah, the universe is huge. And the universe inside a person is huge. So yeah, thank you. Oh, you're, really I really, I love that idea of sort of the, um, the, there's something about the infinite use of a limitation of imagery and scale and creating, they are my universes, you know, um, these are my imaginary places. And there's something fascinating about that. Yeah, the portraits are, are one thing and they're very specific because they're really about the relationship with the human. But I moved away from the human or let's just say I went deeper in. <laughs> so, but there's something that I find fascinating about these geometric, simple geometric linear stencils that allow me to create these other spaces. So thank you. Well, the image of the, you know, the, the, the stencils that you use with the geometric, there's so many lines of connection within each one too. It goes, you know, it just keeps repeating. So yeah, I think. There's James, my big inspiration. <laughs> Would anybody else like to comment or ask questions of, Tobin? Jane has her hand up. That Shields wants to ask. Yeah, please. Jane needs to unmute herself. Uh, okay. Yeah. Rosie, I did want to say something. I'm sorry. Um, I just, uh, Tobin, I, they're just fabulous. They just yeah. blow me away. Um, would, so, Tobin, when you're working on this last piece, you've got the stencil, you've got the ink. Are you making several of those at a time? Uh, like, say, 10, or I mean, you have a, uh, you know what? I should have showed you the screen. I have one yeah. screen with three stencils. And they're okay. each a different size. So, but I also mask out the stencils, Jane. Yeah, yeah. I, sure. I do a paper mask to alter the stencil. Okay. So, okay. in a way, it is cheating. It is more than three stencils, but it's the three stencils that are the base. Yeah, sure. For, for the print. Yeah. But so of this, forever more, forever more, forever more. Are there more? Is it just one or while you were at it, did you just do any other ones? Um, you know what? I usually do studies as I'm working on a large piece. Uh -huh. okay. but 
not this time. I just went direct. You know, I just went. Wow. Now with that, and I started. I started with black ink. That was my foundation for this one. I said, okay, I just want to start with black ink on mm -hmm. white paper and see where it goes. And I, you know, I did photograph each stage. Yeah. Well, anyway, Tobin, lovely, beautiful. Thank mm -hmm. you. Yeah. Very mm -hmm. mystical. Beth, you have a comment? Uh, yes, I do. Hey, Tobin, it's nice to see yeah. you. Likewise. Um, I don't have a question. I just want to uh, thank you. It was fabulous. And what fascinates me, and it was particularly clear with you and Yonat, is th the journey. The journey fascinates me. And, you know, how each stage of what we do then fascinates us in another direction and the continuation of the creative creative obsession. I love when artists use the word obsession, mm -hmm. you know, because it's so powerful. And, you know, I don't think anyone knows where it comes from or why we have it or I agree. so fabulous. And you, you, you definitely took us on a journey. So. Well, thank you, Beth. I love that. Thank you um, for that. Um, the obsession thing, um, you know, you get so excited about one thing and you just follow it and you want to follow it so, so deeply through. And, you know, I question, I certainly question um, when I change a media, when I change material, I question the viability of what it is I'm doing. You know, I do, I do have, um, I, I do have dark moments where I question everything, but um, one thing I keep coming back to are some of the words that my mentor teacher, Jay DeFeo would say, and she said, it doesn't matter what you do, just as long as you stick to it and go as far as you can, no matter what. Oh, and she was known for being true. I don't know if you know Jay's work. She was known for being truly obsessive, especially with her one painting called The Rose that she spent eight years of her life developing and ended years. up laying over a ton of lead-based paint. So if you ever, you don't ever want to know something about Jay DeFeo, I'll put her name in the chat. Um, she was my main mentor when I studied with her at California College of Arts and Crafts and then Mills College. So she's the one that instilled uh, a certain amount of discipline, but also just self-belief. And, and in fact, it just didn't matter um, what I was doing. Just do it and be good at it and don't let it go until it's done. She also said black and white is the only color you need. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I do. I do just want to comment on what you said around the whole dark nights of the soul in work and how it, you know, that that's like so central to risk taking and how, you know, we just keep going. We yeah. Just keep going. Exactly what you said. Thank you. And yeah. what's been really empowering, actually, and I'm fortunate, I get to work with students. And even during COVID, you know, um, I still got to work with students. And even if it was in remote, um, we had these three days a week, we would connect on Zoom and we could just share experiences. We'd share our work. They were still, they were still making awesome stuff, no matter how rugged or um, complex it was. They still, they per persevered. Very famous for that. And, you know, we still, we still made good artwork. And so it was the connection with the students. And I got to say that, you know, the students have been really responsible for, for, I don't know, contributing to my own energy to give back energy to them. Because it is really is energy draining being a teacher. But, it, you know, if you have great students, they just give back so much. That's why I keep going. But I'm going to give it a th another three more years. No. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, oh. All right. <laughs> Tobin, I want to read some chats that are, are here for you. Uh, Bonnie Minardi says, amazing, Tobin. I love your work. Thank you, Bonnie. And Baldwin May, I really like Ever the Evermore. Are there any people there? It's a question. There are no, there may be some imaginary people. Mm -hmm. uh, no, it's strictly the same geometric stencils. Um, but come to the Gabriel Gallery because it has evolved. Um, huh. um, you know, there's a point where I thought, oh, maybe I'll sneak some other imagery in. <laughs> yeah, I, you know, I woke up saying, no, don't do that. Discipline. <laughs> and there's one from Gail Ortiz. You have always and will always blow me away. Gail, you blow me away. Too. 
with your amazing creativity and what you do. Oh, thank you. You're an inspiration too, dear. And Jody Alexander says, thank you, Tobin, for taking us on that creative journey. Beautiful. It's been a pleasure. And Yonat says, very thoughtful and emotion, thought and emotion provoking. Thank you for that inspiring work. You're so welcome, Yonat. Um, and that's reflected back on you. Thank you for your inspiring work. And thank you for this opportunity. You know, it comes at a time um, where, again, it's not, not to, not to keep going back to, oh, it's so hard. It's the hardest week of the, of the year right now. It's flex week and, you know, all yeah. of that. But it's a good break and a rather intensive week just to talk about my artwork. So thank you so much. Well, you gave us a lot. Thank you so much. So wonderful. Thank you. <laughs> and our last wonderful speaker is Jody. So Jody, we're very excited to hear what you have to say. Jody's a mixed media artist who lives and works here in Santa Cruz and in the tiny town of Penn Valley. I'm curious about that in the Sierra foothills. It's a tiny town. It's like less than 2000 people. Mm -hmm. um, well known for her handmade books. She combines textiles, paper, found items and imagery to create books, objects, wall pieces, garments and installations. Her artwork has been exhibited internationally. She teaches book arts nationally and her work appears in a number of prominent art publications. So welcome Jody, and thank you very much for your presentation. Thank you for asking me. And I'll just go right to share screen here to my little show. Okay. All right. Everyone can see that. Yep. Okay. <laughs> a librarian's closet. So, um, yeah, the librarian's closet, her library. <laughs> the two pieces that I have in the PVA show are uh, dresses from this series and installation, installation that you see there that I'll talk a little more about. But um, like Tobin and Yonat, I need to go back a little bit <laughs> to explain um, about the inception of the librarian's closet and the evolution that led there. So I have to go back to 2014 um, with this little sampler book. Uh, it was the first book I made when I was trying to figure out this next series that ended up becoming Keep Modern Library that evolved into Bibliomuse and then into Bibliofrocks and the Librarian's Closet. But this is where I was figuring out where this was going. I was using old European linens. I was using uh, cloth that I had taken off of withdrawn library books. So which mm. whenever, whenever you're seeing color, in these pieces are um, cloth that I've taken off with Ron Library books and also playing around with mending techniques, specifically Japanese mending techniques, but others as well. And printing a little bit, you can see a little printing on there. And the, um, the printing came from this book, Records Management, a collegiate course in filing systems, and <laughs> <laughs> which became my muse for uh, the first part of Keep Modern Library. This was a book that was withdrawn from a certain college library, and mm -hmm. justly so. It um, was filled with uh, paper filing system techniques and showed a number of women in their cute little secretarial outfits filing in different ways. So clearly this didn't belong in a college library anymore, hadn't been checked out in over 10 years, but I just was absolutely in love with this book. So this became part of, this became my muse, something that, um, clearly wasn't useful anymore, but I loved it. And what, what, so what do you, what do you keep and what don't you keep? And that little stamp right there was a stamp that the same library got rid of. So they got rid of the keep stamp. So that <laughs> irony made its way into the title of my keep modern library. And it became an exploration of what, what we keep and what we let go. And when it's okay, 
to keep something and when it's okay to let something go in many ways, physically, emotionally. And it was an exploration of that that lasted about seven years, this, this series. Uh, so this piece, again, uh, old European linen, uh, withdrawn library book skins, um, a lot of stitching, stitching techniques, mending techniques, and uh, printing of my muse. Those, those three icons you can see on the cover of the muse, filing folders, punch cards, and then I, I guess it's like the iris of a eye in a microfilm machine or microfiche machine. <laughs> That's all I could figure out towards the end of the book. They talked a little bit about microfilm and, and microfiche. Uh, so this became, um, a series that I worked on for a while. And it turned into my exhibit um, at the Blitzer Gallery for um, my Rydell exhibit. So here you can see, um, this was the title wall. The title was above those three pieces there. So the, the books that are on the ground there have been skinned. So you can see the books are fine. You can still read them, but I have taken the covers off of all of them. And then on the shelf here, it's, it's um, what I'm calling the shelf list, which is also something that librarians keep, which is the books, it's a card catalog that shows the books in, um, lists the books in call number order. So it makes sense to nobody but the librarians. So whenever I skinned a book, I kept a little sample, um, wrote down the call number on it. So this is call number order. This is uh, all the books in the exhibit in call number order <laughs> that were used in the exhibit. And this is a little wider shot of the exhibit at, um, at Blitzer. This is the opposite wall. And you can see those are the books that um, are also all withdrawn from the same library and um, but in color order. And that's how I kept them in my studio. So it was my palette. You know, I couldn't go mix a color. I couldn't go to the store and buy a color. I had to go through my piles of books and find the color that, that would work for me. So that was my, my color palette. Um, and this is the dress. I think I called it the book mobile because it was kind of the mobile, mobile book dress. And it also had the printing and book skins on it. And I wore it during the opening and closing, I think. Um, so after the Blitzer show, I felt like I wasn't done with working with the withdrawn library books and the book skins, but I was getting kind of tired of the imagery, just those three icons on the, the record management um, book. So I started digging through my books and finding um, other books that had interesting imagery to me that I could use and, and repeat. And I also wanted to play around with some machine stitching. So I'm really, oh, so this is the book, the, the next book that I used, How to Know the Mosses and Liverworts. Uh, and this was the machine stitching I did. So this is machine stitching pretty obsessively back and forth, back and forth over and over again. And it really, created, I kind of patched together the cloth, but I also patched together layers of um, different hues of white to create patches on top of the patches. And um, I, I did, so this was the Bibliomuse one series. I went through um, a few more books as muses. I, I found a few more books as muses with fabulous imagery in them. Art of Awareness was filled with really wonderful kind of atomic imagery in it. So I created um, more wall pieces, some books. This is an accordion book called Hemingway and the Art of Awareness. All the book skins in this one are skinned off of withdrawn Hemingway novels. Um, and they were withdrawn from the library because they were just loved too much. They were damaged and overused and they needed to be uh, replaced. So, um, so I kind of got over this obsessive stitching. I, I melted a sewing machine part so that my sewing machine wasn't workable anymore. And I kind of felt like I had, that had run, it, run its course. Um, 
so I, I continued to look to for books and there, there are many more in, in, in between here, but this was one that um, it was real simple imagery, the scandal of silence. I also love that the titles of these, they just seem so loaded and um, simple imagery though on this one. So I took off on those um, rectangular vertical bars, but also you can see a very faint faded squiggle mark there that I think had to do with how it was positioned in the stacks and how it faded. So in this piece, in this new phase of the series is Bibliomuse 2, I went back to hand stitching, I played around with the um, scale of some of the imagery, small and big, and repeated patterns. You can see the squiggle that I made into a stencil and repeated. So all the imagery is either stencils, block print, or image transfers, depending on um, how the image would work. So this is um, natural dye. I was also in, interested in natural dyes at the time, which I still am. So this was woad dyed, W-O-A-D, which is known as the European indigo. And I dyed the fabric when I was in France teaching. And um, yeah, I made um, the biblium. So there's a little more of a close up and the, the squiggle on the left is a European mend or a French mend that I saw on some French grain sacks that I really fell in, in love with. So there's a little Japanese mending, a little, little French mending in here and then the French woad. So biblium used to consisted of four, just four wall pieces in four accordion books that accompanied them. And I used woad and um, persimmon dye, walnut dye, and some uh, one, two pieces of India ink, and then another that was just natural, natural pieces. So you kind of need to know about all of that to understand what's going on in the librarian's closet, in her library. So, um, Somewhere in there towards the end of those Bibliomuse two pieces, and maybe during it, I'm not sure how they overlapped. I started, or the imagery started making its way onto these uh, dresses, these old European frocks that I was collecting and just loved. And they had repairs on them, heavy use, and I was having fun altering them. And um, so this, um, this culminated in an installation at In Cahoots Residency in Petaluma, California, that's run by my friend Macy Chadwick, fabulous residency. They do, uh, it's mostly book arts, but also she has etching presses, um, letter presses, and she has this cute little writing studio that I really fell in love with the first time I saw it. I had visited her a couple times up there, and I just knew I had to do an installation in there someday. So during the pandemic, um, I went there. Um, we had planned before the pandemic, we had planned for me to go there and teach a little workshop. And I had kind of signed up for a week. Of course, that didn't happen. So I said, I'm coming anyway. I'm going to do this, this installation. The librarian needs her closet. So, so this is the little, um, her, this is her closet. So her little, her little shack, it would have been better if maybe it was windowless, but I, I actually end up liking the, the windows in it. And, um, and while I was there, so uh, there's frocks that are also, uh, that are printed with imagery from withdrawn library books, genetics, paleontology, and evolution is this one. Um, I'd worked with it back in Bibliomuse one series. And then I also made this wall um, while I was there. I ended up spending most of my, make, my week making this wall because it was part of the, the back wall was covered in that like push pin cork stuff, white, really ugly. So I knew I had to cover it. And so I had all these old stationary pads of paper and things that I collect with me. And um, I started making this wall. So, and, and it ended up being a really great backdrop for the, the photos, but that's what I spent a lot of my time on. That's all of the imagery from all of the muses, all of the withdrawn library books that are the muses and there's call numbers and authors and titles and, and things on the wall. Um, here's the art of awareness in dress form. 
and dynamics of plan change is fabulous bloomers that I found. These are all very old, worn, tattered. Here it is how, how it was placed in the, in the installation. How to know the mosses and liverworts, which we've seen that imagery before. So all these dresses have uh, the imagery printed on them, but also their um, author title and call number embroidered on them. Impact of social sciences. <clears throat> and here's the back of that one. You can see the embroidery down the spine of that one. Incredible truth. This, uh, this garment is wonderful. It's kind of an adult onesie. It's got little buttons down at the crotch. It's very amusing. Um, it's one of my favorite ones, I think. Theory of Collective Behavior, which is a, a book that I used a lot. And then the Word Finder, this is a piece that's in the um, PVA show. So it's a sweet little reference book that this imagery is um, on, on, this, on this piece from. Lots of mending, lots of really beautiful mending on this old frock. Um, there it is in the window. And then this piece is also in the PVA show and I call this the index, but it's really kind of a shelf list. So on this dress is a, a sampling of printing from each of the um, bibliomuses and the accompanying call number. So it's kind of a, it's kind of a list of all of the books slash bibliomuses that have been used in, in her closet. And there's the back of the dress and the dress in the, as it is in the installation. So it was the pandemic. So of course she made herself a mask and, and um, printed on it the very, the very first Bibliomuse um, imagery from that very first records management piece. And she also made these book-like objects. And so, um, <laughs> that's part of her library. I thought they were going to be a separate person, but they ended up being, I think, the same person. So I'm going to read you a little something. When I when I make installations, I I don't uh, that um, embody these people. Um, I don't always know what's going on. I'm just kind of compelled to make these objects. I keep going with it. I'm not sure why, and eventually the story kind of emerges, but I like to leave a lot of it. I'd like to know not too much. And I like you not to know too much because I want you to bring some of you to it. So while I was here and I had time to spend a whole week <clears throat> with her in this little room, I just wrote a little something uh, about her. So the librarian has found herself in a world without books. As a result, she surrounds herself with imagery from library books as well as details of the book's bookness, call number, author, title, publisher, dedications, markings, etc. She embellishes her garments and walls and creates book-like objects, but no real books. Are the real books gone or does she no longer have access to them? Or perhaps she has been expelled from the book world. No matter which, this is now her library. So that's a, some clues as to maybe what's going on in her world. I don't have all the answers and maybe you can come up with some of them. So these are these little book-like objects that I make with old, um, I love old office materials, old file folders, papers, pads of papers. I, I collect them whenever I find them at thrift stores. And she made these book-like objects with the uh, Bibliomuse um, imagery on it, which I continued to expand for this. But these are book-like. They don't open, but they've got the bookness on them, the titles, the call numbers, the dedications are, are written on them. Um, oh, and there she is. The <laughs> There's the librarian in her closet um, looking longingly out the window at the world, thinking about the world that used to have books in it. So um, that was me um, in the, <laughs> at the time in the, the installation. Um, so that's the story of the librarian's closet. Um, a few people got to see it since it was COVID, um, not many, but Macy did invite a few people to come out and see my work and the other residents work that week. And so it, it was fun just getting it 
into the space, um, seen it all together and have time to kind of think about what, what it was all about. So I have moved on. So this was 20, March, 2021. I still have all these things and would like to show them more for sure. I'd like to show them in their entirety somewhere someday. Um, where more people could see them. But I have moved on, like it seems like all the three of us tonight continue to evolve and move. So um, at the beginning of the pandemic, I started a series called What It Was that was based on imagery that I collected in Japan. And it's gone through an evolution in the two years since I started it. And this most recent um, phase I started last summer with cyanotypes. <clears throat> excuse me, so I started doing cyanotypes. So this is all photographs and stencils from my trips to Japan. So these are toned cyanotype, cyanotypes um, stitched on old European linen, stitched together. Um, <clears throat> I'm also making garments still. This is, I call it a studio coat. And there's me with a, another piece. So, and that's my website, Instagram, and Wishy Washy Studio is another name that I use. So, um, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jody. <laughs> wow. It's, I feel it's hard to talk about your work. It's so, <laughs> it's very endearing. There's something about, uh, there's a closeness and a sweetness uh, that you bring forth. And in the beginning, you talked about um, keeping and letting go the, the difference about those books, keep, you know, what books go, what books stay, what, what books go. And then there's one question I have about before I go on, but there, I don't understand how you cut where the color comes from is it a cloth cover that you that you unskin or something yeah yeah I, skin, I used to skin them i don't really do it anymore mm -hmm. and i passed my collection on to an artist who's doing uh, this huge thing at burning man she's making this huge altar to old books and so i mm. passed them all on so i don't do it anymore but yeah they're they're old most of the books were from the 30s 40s and 50s they came in just these gorgeous colors and yeah you just kind of worry at a corner and you just one more start ripping off the cloth and okay. you get lots of different things some of it um falls apart some of it too stiff to work with <clears throat> some i had to soak in water to get the paper off the back so that was a, a big part of the the process is readying mm -hmm. my uh cloth to be used and then the titles and the content of the, <clears throat> what might be the content of those books you know, it's they go they can go anywhere using those titles and just using your your few the three selected images that you used over and over again. I don't I can't find the words really. But there's something that's so compelling and so kind and so um, I don't know maybe it's you the librarian. <laughs> <But> <laughs> And I was, I mean, I think a lot of you know, but I, I was a librarian for 30 years and you noticed I said was because I've retired from that um, about, yeah, about 10 years doing it full time and then about 20, 20 plus years doing it part time while I did art and teaching my art um, the other part time. So um, yeah, I'm no longer the librarian and maybe that's what the librarian's closet was about. Maybe I knew that that was coming. I don't, I don't know. Sometimes I don't know what things are about until I look back on them. I think all of my installations that are based on characters, when I'm in it, I'm just like, I don't know. I don't know what this person's doing. I don't know. But then I look back on it, I'm like, oh my God, that was totally what was going on in my mm -hmm. life, you know, but I, I didn't see it. So um, yeah, working on the characters is really fun. I can't force it though. They have to come to me right now. There is mm -hmm. no character that has come to me, but um, one might come. I just have to wait. <laughs> Well, it, the warmth comes through and it's really, you know, you're, you're being in touch with all of that is very evident. So thank you. Any more questions or uh, 
Beth, yes. <laughs> Are you muted? Yeah. No. I always have something to say, don't I? Um, Jody, thank you so much. Um, and I was inspired when you were talking about doing the installations and not, not and having it be so visceral where it all comes from and without the cerebral part of understanding the emotion or whatever. So what I want to tell you, and I've wanted to tell you this for years, <laughs> is that, you know, I go and look at a lot of exhibits and I've done it my whole life and I love looking at art and it's just such a great way to live. So I went to see your exhibit at Cabrillo College. I hope I don't cry. Um, <laughs> when you did that, you had the whole gallery and you did an installation. I'm sure you remember that, right? Yeah. So I was alone. I love going to look at art alone. and. Um, I walked around for a long time and um, I had such a avalanche of emotion that I had no idea what it was about. You know, the best thing that can happen from my point of view, looking at art is, you know, having this emotional response to the work that is inexplicable. And it was so deep and so sweet. And I went outside and sat, you know, when you sit outside the gallery, you can kind of look out and there was hardly anybody around. And I sat on the bench and I just started to weep. <laughs> oh my God, Jody! I just <gasps> wept. And I had no idea. There was no mental understanding of what it was about. So I wanted to tell you that because to me, from who I am, it was like the biggest compliment I could give an artist, you know, that you touched me so deeply in this inexplicable and very sweet and kind of bittersweet way. Well, so thank it, you. It was yeah. complex and intense. So anyway, I just have embarrassed myself, so I'm gonna mute myself now. No, thank but you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you for sharing. Yeah, that yeah, that was called preparing for evanescence, and and it was it was about disappearing, um, like a, a person disappearing, and it could be um, interpreted in many ways. Um, you know, physically disappearing, um, or, or mentally, or even in a sci-fi way, like time traveling was even part of it. And she, that it was a person. I, I didn't want to give uh, the person a, a pronoun, but I, I, I think a lot of people assumed it was a woman because there was so much thread and, and stitching in it. But um, I'll just say they, because I don't want to assume it's a woman and I don't know for sure. And they were preparing their home because they knew that they were disappearing and we're not sure how. So, and you're not the, the, the only one that's had a similar um, experience there. At the time I was working in the library right upstairs from it and I would have people come in and just, yeah, say these amazing things to me. And they got, everyone got a little something different out of it. So um, yeah, thanks. And, and yeah, that I felt like that was a success. I like to like people to walk in and be in another another world another person's world but not know quite what's going on and that way part of themselves are you know is is put into the installation or they put themselves into the installation because they don't know the whole story some people say oh you should record it you should record the story I'm like no 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 that would be telling them what to think I want I want the visitors to come up with with some of the narrative so well that was that was part of the reason it was so powerful so I think you're yeah, yeah. just so astute yeah. about that thank you Jody, there are some chat remarks too. I'll read to you. Um, Bonnie Minardi says, "Very inspiring, Jody." And Tobin says, "Jody, I love your disciplined use of imagery and color, and of course, your beautifully beautiful organizational mythology mythology methodology." Thank you. Uh, Gail Ortiz, so peaceful. Love your work and the way you approach it, Jody. I think peaceful is a really good word for that. Uh, Yonat says, nurturing art, beautiful. And Roberta, thank you, Jody. I love how you refer to the librarian maid and her books. 
like an author speaking of her characters as, as another person. How do you let her guide you? <laughs> well, that's another thing people that you say author, a lot of people, if when I do talks or uh, mostly when I do talks and I talk about them, they uh, come up to me like after a, a talk or something and say, are you a writer? And um, cause you're, you know, the way your, your process is, so, you know, sounds kind of similar to how a writer writes maybe fiction. And I said, no, I'm not a writer. And I think maybe, but I love stories and maybe this is my way of, of telling stories is through objects. Cause I love make, I love objects. I love collecting objects, I like making objects. So I guess that's how I I'm guided. I'm guided by the making. I'm compelled to make something to begin with. Who knows? Maybe it starts with an object or just a technique I want to start. And then I keep going and I keep going, I keep going. And then I have to kind of pause and say, wait, what, what's going on here? Who's, who's doing this? <laughs> who's doing this? And then while I'm working and I do very, repetitive work. Um, while I'm doing that work, I have a lot of time to think and to think about who this person is and, and what they're doing. And um, yeah, so often materials guide me, but then the materials sometimes tell me a little bit of the story, then the story will come, you know, will, will keep me going or in another direction. Um, and yeah, and then as as quickly as it appears, it disappears. And there's a day where it's just like, okay, I'm done. The, that person's gone. I'm, I'm done. It's over. <laughs> yeah. And one more comment from Leslie Bixel. So great. Thank you, Jody. Thank you. And you're welcome. Well, this really has been fabulous. And, um, you know, you all three of you bring such, so much to think about. And uh, there's wonderful history, wonderful feeling, wonderful imagery, you know, and just in depth in all three of you. And it's been a true pleasure having the three of you present tonight. Thank you, thank you, thank you.